kan man ta med det ljuset där borta på. Jag har inte kommit på vilket som är min dåliga. Det är några som är Det är några som Ja, vilken ska man ta? Den, kan, den ena är till Facebook, den andra är till Youtube. Ja, okay. Så det är, det är det du känner ja. mest för. Liksom. Ja, det är Det är möjligt att det är ut lite på det också. Jag vet inte. Det... Ja, 
Oturdu. Ska du prata nu också? Då ska du ha mastigt mitt för dig. Hej, jag ser dig live. <laughs> ja. All right. Men då kör vi igång. Det blir nog så här, lite folk här. Men vi switchar över till engelska. Så so I think we're just going to switch over to English. Uh, now and uh, so yeah. You want and I would like to welcome you. Uh, to the speaker's corner, Barrel AI gathering here. It's an experiment, uh, so we hope it's going to be something we can repeat many times okay. uh, because uh, we have this uh, lovely crowd here today, uh, but we have many more who would actually like to attend uh, after summer. This is middle of summer. Uh, and also Corona summer. So yeah, hopefully you have a very, um, yeah, much more healthy uh, season uh, in autumn. And uh, then we're gonna have some more speaker corners. One, two, three, four, five, and yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, this event is in collaboration with Get AI uh, and a little bit sponsored by Nordaxon. We have some chips and uh, wine and, uh, and uh, refreshments over there. We have already found that. Uh, like I said, we also have a very famous person here who will, who is uh, behind the camera over there, uh, Joakim Jarenberg, uh, who is live streaming us now on a number of channels. Uh, I don't know how many are seeing us now. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, Hi. Yeah, a little bit nervous. <laughs> yeah. uh, we are not used to this. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Everybody, uh, share uh, the uh, streaming. It's up on the Barrel uh, LinkedIn page now. So you can just share that one. There is one on uh, YouTube and one uh, for Facebook. So go ahead, just uh, you know, share it with others because uh, uh, what's coming next is very much interesting. Um, so this is agenda. We have uh, we're having a small intro about uh, Barrel now, uh, and uh, after that we have uh, actually five preachers uh, who will tell us uh, about their interesting projects they have been doing um, last um, yeah I don't know couple of months year depending. Uh, so we are very much looking forward to that. Um, we have Marcus, Isabella, David, and Jacob and Mar will be um, telling us about interesting AI ML related uh, projects. We have a networking break in between, 
So I don't know. It's more like if we feel like we are tired, we're not so tired after two, we we do like three directly. I don't know. Let's see how it feels, how the energy is in the room. Anyway, refreshments over there. Um, yes. Do we have anything more to add to this one? Um, no, it's the agenda. That's the agenda, yeah. We yeah. have one here, but we also have a networking event. Uh, we can go down to the uh, bar X and have uh, some more after work if we are up for that when we are down here. All right. Uh, so I'm just, you know, I forgot to say, like, you know, this uh, speaker corner event is basically the whole idea was that people just come up and just tell, you know, like interesting stuff they're doing. Now it's more organized. But if you, if somebody else here in the room have something, you know, interesting to say, you know, it's just to come up here and share with us and internet out there. Uh, a little bit about Barrel AI, not uh, too much, uh, but it's a pro bono community. Uh, so we've been uh, around since 2017. Summer yes. 2017. Basically three years now. Yeah. So the yeah. summer summer of 17, yeah. Summer of 17. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Time goes by very fast. Uh, today we are actually 700 members. Yeah. So not all of them are active ones, but uh, we do count 700 members. Uh, we have had uh, around 50 gatherings, um, different gatherings. Uh, and uh, I don't know what should we say. I mean, basically, we, we are community for you ML AI experts by us ML experts. So it's a very geeky community. Uh, we really like to dig into the models and really like, you know, kind of know it's not so much about uh, um, all this, you know, not concrete stuff about AI, but really like, you know, we speak about uh, Bayesian models and all networks and, and uh, all kind of stuff. You want really short to uh, tell a bit more about um, different stuff we have been doing three years. Yeah, we started out um, uh, the Barrel AI uh, in uh, 17. And uh, basically for me, it was, I was uh, studying on online courses and then you don't meet that much many students. And uh, uh, Melina was working with machine learning slightly. On, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, we got together and uh, created the Barrel AI uh, because we wanted to meet other people who was working with the machine learning. I was interested in machine learning because as you share your uh, findings and your knowledge and try to teach others, you will learn even more and get feedback. So that's what we wanted to do. And um, um, then we um, also want you to learn and want you to share. So. The community is more or less uh, open-based, so anyone who has an interest or uh, something they want to share, they are welcome to come to us and we can help organize or set up a venue. Uh, or uh, in this case, we are using the speaker's corner to lower the threshold because over the years we've been doing everything from simple after works where we've discussed uh, the impacts of machine learning on society and stuff like that. And, and we've had professors coming and having hour long presentations of what they're doing and uh, really mind boggling things. Um, and, and this is somewhere in between where we want to encourage the community more to come up and, and share what they are doing. Um, and we also want to uh, uh, do Kaggletons. We have uh, done that before as well. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting things that goes on. Um, but it's been up and down. We've been quite busy uh, the last year. Mm. And uh, it has not been that many events, but we want to make more events. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, we actually spend a lot of time trying to connect with other machine learning AI community. Uh, and we spent more time on that last year than we did on creating event, actually. But uh, there were a little bit too few resources and too high ambitions. So that didn't pan out with very much. But now we are uh, back again and uh, we are talking to AI Sweden and Get AI and, and trying to uh, do some more. Mm -hmm. We are here to stay. We're not going away, even though it goes up and down uh, eventually. Um, and for the future, yeah, we would like to do more of these events and invite the community to be part of this. Mm. Uh, if you have an idea and thought that you want to do anything you want to learn, we could find uh, people with the knowledge and have presentations on that. So feel free to shout out and say what you want. Yeah, 
exactly that's, that's it. exactly but um yeah very good wrapping up uh, i mean i still believe we i mean we had some events last year and you know like yeah, in, we in winter we had this very interesting uh, uh auto tagger for uh, city polana or yeah. one of your um, other um, startups or what we say yeah yeah exactly uh, and uh, yeah and we've been invited to some festivals uh for critical tech uh, was no it was critical, uh tech barbecue in copenhagen and uh, um, i don't know you know for scorn it was one for that yeah so very yeah. much different things after you start startup owners being here and telling about their ai ml models they're using uh, in in um, yeah in the startup to professors like you said and uh, yeah yeah we've been um, around hosting events uh, yeah. ourselves on a presentations anyway uh stay in touch with us uh we want you to be more like um you know active the members out there on the internet so there are many different can the channels you can uh, find us on uh, everything from uh, barrel on barrel.ai you find everything uh but then we are also on linkedin and facebook and uh, slack and uh and meetup is our uh, channel for signing up for events yeah. uh, for the moment yeah we have anything more to say so or I should think... we just hand over to, to preachers? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get started. Yeah. All right. So the stage is yours, Mike, Marcus. You are first out to preach about interesting stuff. Uh, I'm just going to open your. Um, vill du köra med din eller? Ja. Yeah. Annars har vi... Men då är den här okay. billiga in. Det känns lite smidigt. Mm -hmm. Då gör vi så. Jag tar min maskin här. Fall down. So let's see. If this works. And if it's visible, it is kind of visible. Hi! Hello. So good to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Sporg. Um, I'm with the Rice Research Institutes of Sweden. It's awesome to be here at the live event. I've been uh, presenting things virtually now the last weeks. It's great to see people. It's been a while. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, AI testing, or actually AI meta testing, and I will explain what I mean by that in, in a few minutes. Uh, but since this is my first time in this community, I know a couple of people from before, actually, but uh, I just wanted to say a few words about my background to kind of uh, show, show you why I'm here now. Uh, so I have a background as a developer, uh, development engineer here in Malmö. I worked with ABB in FUSI in the domain of process automation. I worked as a compiler and editor engineer, actually, for a few years. Um, so basically working on the tool chain used by automation engineers to download uh, control programs down to machines like this, small devices, uh, controlling industry processes of various sorts, safety critical stuff typically, uh, it has to be correct and work. Then uh, I returned to the university to do a PhD and uh, I ended up working uh, on machine learning. So that is kind of how I entered this, this area. I, I had this uh, very applied research project on using machine learning to support various software engineering tasks and big projects, mostly related to bug management, things like severity prediction of incoming bugs and assignment, uh, automated assignment to, to the right development team and things like that. Since a few years back, I am a researcher with RISE, Research Institutes of Sweden, and this is um, a state-owned research institute with a mission to support innovation here in Sweden and also to bridge academia and industry to make sure good ideas from 
from academia uh, reach um, Swedish businesses and organizations. And this is fun. And what I'm really passionate about uh, at the moment is AI quality assurance. And this is what I will talk about today. I'm also an adjunct lecturer with Lund University 20% to do teaching. Um, I supervise students, master thesis projects and things like that. Um, so that's that's me. Today I'm going to talk about woohoo AI. Uh, that's nice. It's good to be here in this uh, community because I don't need to tell you much about how cool AI is and what you can do with it. So that saves me some time. Um, but what I can say is that a lot of cool AI IDs are really cool and perhaps still looking for the uh, value adding applications. Uh, uh, a lot of it is still proof of concepts, entertainment and, and cool things. But there are of course also things that are very mature. Uh, I work at the moment pretty much with the automotive industry on object detection and recognition and, uh, and there are also many other uh, applications that are uh, definitely value adding at the moment. But I'm going to talk a bit about uh, those applications that are perhaps not so much about entertainment, but more critical applications where you need to be able to trust the AI. And yeah, the motivation is why do we need AI testing? And yeah, of course, in the automotive domain, it's quite easy to argue that, well, we've seen Tesla crashes, we've seen the Uber crash and, and things like that. So that's kind of obvious. But it's not only about image, uh, computer vision applications in, in, in the public traffic. There are also other things where you need to uh, assure what is going on. We have, for example, the chatbot, the Microsoft chatbot that turned Nazi after just a few hours. Uh, Amazon sexist AI recruiters, another example, also text-based examples. We need to align somehow uh, expectations and what actually is, uh, is coming out of the other, yeah, in the end. So AI testing, this is what I'm talking about today and preaching about, I guess. Uh, so my perspective is that software has evolved to another where. So we have the conventional hardware software split, but we now have also as a very important subset of the software bubble here is AI. And uh, with this fuzzy kind of uh, cloud uh, shape, because it's still hard to say what we mean by AI. There is no consensus there. Something about intelligence for sure, but um, it's a little bit in the eye of the beholder. But what we have uh, that is more concrete is the machine learning enabled systems that are still software. Um, but uh, yeah, for example, supervised learning, I will probably restrict my, my examples today to supervised learning examples. but. I refer to this as MLware, so kind of a new animal here uh, that we need to tackle or not tackle, uh, make use of and make friendly. Um, but it's not only the machine learning models, of course, because there is so much software still uh, running in the show. Uh, so it's a combination here of conventional source code and uh, trained models, basically. Another view on this is the Android Carpathy view. I think you've seen the the uh, argumentation he has in a, in a blog post that we have the first generation of software, humans explicitly uh, expressing logic in, in source code. And that controls, the control flow is there, you can understand what is going on. But then he talks about the next generation of software where you let go of some of the control to instead uh, let back propagation and stochastic gradient descent, find those weights in the networks. And then it's more about data flow than control flow. So it's a new paradigm, it's, it's something else, but very useful, of course. Uh, so my, uh, what I claim here today, or what I preach about is that software testing needs to co-evolve with the software evolution we see now. So we no longer can rely on the conventional best practices we have had for, for decades, things like code coverage testing, because the uh, the magic happens in the training data, much of it. So I mean, you can do your statement coverage, branch coverage, all the way up to MCDC coverage of your source code, but it's not really enough because it's not there where we have the logic at the moment. We need to do more. Same thing with static testing techniques, code reviews, everyone does that. Same thing here, of course you can code review your Python code that calls various APIs in the tech stack, but that will only get you so far. You need to do something 
more than that, it's not enough. And um, academia is aware of this challenge, and uh, there is an increasing trend now of uh, AI testing, machine learning testing uh, publications. This is um, an, uh, a picture from uh, a recently published systematic review of uh, AI ML testing. And as you see here, you see uh, for each year the number of publications they counted here. And uh, there is no question about it. There would be this incoming avalanche of just so many papers from uh, the academic uh, world uh, on AI testing. Some things will be really cool and useful. Some things will just be strange. Uh, that's how research works. You try out many things, and some things work, and some, uh, some are just strange. Uh, so there is a need for someone to kind of aggregate what is out there. And this is something I see um, a potential to make a difference and contribute to the local ecosystem. And I will talk about the AIQ initiative in a few slides. So what does the research propose then? What's in this avalanche of papers? Um, a lot of that is uh, adaptation of existing software testing research. First, I would just like to say that software testing research is like two decades um, more advanced than state of practice testing. There is still so much manual testing going on in, uh, in industry and some of the uh, ideas in the academic testing community, they still haven't reached uh, all the way out to industry. And that's too bad. I think it's partly because being a tester in, in, in software industry has kind of a low status. So it's, uh, it's not really there, it's happening. But there is so much cool things you can do with, uh, with advanced software testing. Just some examples uh, that have been adapted for ML testing. Fuzz testing using randomness in, in the input. Search-based test input generation is something I have worked on. For example, using genetic algorithms to evolve test cases that actually stress your systems. Uh, I'm co-supervising a PhD student, Mashid Helali, at the moment. She does this with reinforcement learning to learn uh, critical test cases. There is concolic testing. There is metamorphic testing. I will return to that. There is mutation testing is one of my favorites, where you systematically inject faults in your production code. And then you see if your test cases actually detects it. Um, so yeah, and then there are also those totally new approaches to testing, and this is where I will show some examples today. Um, metamorphic testing with GANs, neuron coverage, a new concept, and also the concept of surprise adequacy. Time-wise. Um, so first I'm going to talk about metamorphic testing then. So this is an image, it's very hard for you to see in the back, I realize, but this is an image we have from uh, a pedestrian tunnel in Helsingborg. Uh, so we had a student project now running in May where uh, the students trained a classifier to uh, look for, well, basically bicycles, uh, dog walkers and pedestrians in this tunnel, um, standard uh, classification uh, model there. Uh, and what you can do with metamorphic testing, which is quite cool, is if you have some input and you know what the output should be, if you then make a change to the input, for example, changing the illumination in the tunnel, it should still be the same label in the end. So this is one uh, approach to uh, address the so-called oracle problem in software testing. And what you can do then is to use GANs. That is what we did in this project to change the, the input image. So for this example, let's say we send this image through the network and it says it's a bicyclist. It's of course wrong here, but anyway. Um, then uh, we can use a GAN then. In this example, we trained a cycle GAN to do style transformations. So we changed to, to daylight conditions in the network. And then we can again send the same image through the network and see if we get the same results. And here we didn't. So we, we have something that looks suspicious here in this example. OK, I have two more examples. Um, neuron coverage testing is something that is 
hot in academia. We don't really know yet how useful it is. It's analogous to code coverage testing for conventional source code. So the idea is if you have this animal cl classifier here, uh, you have a network, and if you send a tiger through this animal classifier, you will activate neurons in some uh, pattern like that. And then you have covered some of the neurons. And then you can send another input through the network, and then you will activate some new neurons. And the idea is with neuron coverage that you want to have test cases that exercise your network completely. You have input that actually activates all the neurons. And uh, in the end, you will find it hard, I guess, to, to, uh, to find the test cases to activate the last ones. But there are ways to do that and generate those test cases in, uh, automatically here. It was an armadillo that was missing to get the last, uh, last uh, uh, neuron activated here. So there are some empirical uh, uh, indications that this can be used to increase the robustness of your networks. But we need to, to do more research here and see if it's actually uh, value adding. The final one I want to mention here is surprise adequacy testing. Again, a network for animal classification, cat classifier this time. And the idea is you have trained this network to classify cats, and then you have this um, training set. And you know for this training set, you have a mean activation pattern here in this network. So if you, for example, send a tiger through this cat classifier, you can see how kind of the fingerprint of this tiger activates neurons in the function uh, in the network here and then you have this closeness to mean indicator here in the bottom part of the figure and the tiger was very close to the mean actually it looks like uh, not so surprising input uh, we send a domestic cat through the network uh, still close to the mean but then we bring in hello kitty and we say oh it's a snow leopard but it's very surprising input and the idea here with the surprise adequacy testing is that you want to have surprising input also to see what happens. And this is an approach then that can guide you to those test cases that uh, are, yeah, it's kind of a, a measure of out of distributionness, kind of. So you want to see strange things in the network. And this is cool. And this was a Swedish professor in Gothenburg that was involved in, in um, developing this idea here, Robert Felt. And that's cool. Okay, so AIQ, what I want to do with this then is um, um, trying to stay on top of what is happening in academia when it comes to AI testing. And this is then what I refer to as a meta testbed. So AIQ is a testbed for testing AI testing. So there are already testbeds for AI, but we want to test AI testing. And we have a pre-study now running funded by uh, the city of Helsingborg and campus Helsingborg. And uh, at the moment, it's me and a uh, uh, talented student, August, working on this together, uh, trying to see, explore the potential of establishing a meta testbed like this. And the mission for that testbed would then be to really do this research cherry picking from the uh, bulk of uh, academic papers coming out. Uh, the most promising ideas, try them, scale them up, see if they work, validate them in a control setting, and then package them provide guidelines to the local ecosystem for how to actually use it. Courses in education, PhD supervision, of course, we would like to have active research in the area. Uh, maybe in-house AI testing, bring your model, we can test it for bias, things like that. And um, yes, this is a pre-study running until the end of the year. We have um, some uh, other people in the background involved, and there is also more funding uh, behind the scenes. We hope to extend this also to, to continue next year. But uh, yeah, this is what I wanted to, to preach about today. I think there is time for questions, although I suspect I talked for 15 minutes already. Yes. Are there cases where you won't get total neuron coverage? Yes. What can you do then? Many. Prune the network, maybe. Maybe you should just remove some stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's the. I think it's probably the same for normal code coverage, actually. You don't get complete code coverage because there are so corny cases and there are also dependencies that mean this will never happen. So, it's the same here, I would say. But this is. 
still very shaky work actually the neuron coverage parts i would probably claim that surprise adequacy has uh, probably more potential i think but um yeah it's worth exploring yes i would imagine that the, the uh, neuron coverage sample would be a, a great tool for optimizing your network uh, layout the structure of the network yeah why not i think there might be other ways to use this tool Exactly. It might not be for for quality assurance and testing. It can be for optimization. Yes. If you know that there are two layers where almost only two nodes are used, basically. Yeah. We Why skip keep to them in the network? Of the of all the others. That's a good point. I don't know if the original authors of this paper have uh, speculated uh, in that direction, but maybe they did. I haven't read that one in detail, actually. Mm -hmm. How do you test your networks? It's not easy, right? I mean, it's part of the development. I mean, you test all the time. That's part of it. But uh, I mean, yeah. it's a new topic kind of, and it's, um, it will, of course, get uh, increasingly important in the future. Yeah. I hear the ventilation system. <laughs> well, the pre-study is more about uh, exploring the potential of establishing a thing like this. So it uh, uh, pretty much started in May and uh, we will uh, release some reports on, the, uh, on how promising this is by the end of the year. But uh, hopefully we will also be able to um, do something more hands-on, having some demonstrator uh, doing full. Um, that's that's the ambition, and that's what we want to do. Maybe continuing working with the tunnel access camera in the tunnel in Helsingborg. That's a fine test bed for us at the moment. Yeah, how much of it do we want to use? And it's uh, camera data. Yes. Um, it's action uh, triggered, so I mean, we, we only look at when things actually happen in the, in the camera, but um, in the tunnel, but yeah, it's a good, uh, yeah. it's a good playground for us. You find strange things in tunnels, one could say. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for attention Oh, nice. Om du trycker på presentera från början, kommer inte upp då, eller? Ja. Det är bara att visa hela affärmen. Ja, så. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Isabella, and today I will be presenting my master thesis. And please bear in mind, we're not done yet. Uh, so this is like preliminary results. Uh, but we will be presenting in August, so it's uh, we're quite close to the end. So um, in Sweden, we can do master thesis two by two if you want to. And I have done this with a course mate. And today I will be presenting my part of the project, but he has done uh, another method as well. So basically what this is, is that we have uh, been doing this for a company. 
they are called Minutes. They are based here in Malmö and they do kind of a home alarm system. It looks like a fire alarm hub and they do analysis of sound and temperature and air pressure amongst other things and they do not use um, cameras. Uh, so yeah, you can keep a track of your home, what's happening, if someone is moving there, etc. And so what they wanted us to solve was basically, can we, um, can we appreciate how many people are in a room based on a recording? So we're assuming that every person in a room will speak at some time. And can we then count the number of unique voices and uh, get to know how many people are actually in there? So to make this a bit more scientific, scientific, we really wanted to be able to know if we, using a convolutional network and uh, the MFCC transform, if we could identify unique voices. And we had a problem. We had no realistic data sets and we had no money to buy one. So we had to come up with a solution and the solution was to actually make a data set algorithmically. Um, and the way that we did this was using uh, basically audiobooks and mixing uh, them together. And we used statistics from a FICA session or coffee session with friends where Jakob was part as well. But first we had to do a baseline so we could base our results off of something. So here we actually found a data set. Uh, but as I said, it's not realistic. Uh, I will explain why in just a second. And so basically what we did was we had a super simple regressional uh, convolutional net and we had um, the data, we had classes zero to 10, which means that we had zero people talking up until 10 people talking. And these were our results for the baseline. Um, so this is the mean absolute error, which means that we predict somewhere between one and 10, maybe sometimes even 11 or 12, even though that was not even in our classes. Uh, but it's a float number, so we, we could predict 2.4 or 5.6, where the actual class was maybe 4. So we could see how far off our predictions actually were. Um, so this was actually a pretty good result. We had the mean absolute error around 1 uh, or even below 1 for most of the classes, uh, which means that for if there were 10 people speaking, the largest error would be 9, that we guessed 9, which is pretty good, right? But the problem with the data set was that everybody was speaking at the same time. So for class two, you had two people speaking at the same time. And that is not how a dialogue looks, right? So we had to come up with a solution. So we built actually two different data sets with these audiobooks. Uh, the first one, we really wanted to minimize the bias. And by that, I mean, we really wanted to try to force the model to see um, unique voice identificators in the MFCC transforms. I will go into MFCC transforms soon. And so what we tried to do was that we only did actually classes one to five uh, because we didn't have to do any more to realize it didn't work. Um, but what we did was for class one, we had five clips of the same person saying different utterances after each other. And we made sure that we minimized the bias. So each utterance is about the same time long. I mean, about half a second or something. And then for class two, there were two people talking, different utterances, also five clips together. And that was one sample. So this is an example for, uh, for class five. The different um, colors indicate different persons. And then we had the second data set that we thought was more realistic, where there is actually overlapping speech sometime. Maybe someone is interrupting, maybe two people are talking, and then three people are talking in higher classes. Uh, there can be a lot of different conversation, conversations going on at the same time, and we wanted to be able to capture that. So this is a, an, another example of class five, where you can see actually some overlapping uh, of the signals. <clears throat> So now, what is MFCC? So this is actually a transform that is commonly used in speaker recognition tasks, and it captures phonemes. And basically, phonemes are the sounds that make up the words that we are saying. So when you're using maybe Alexa or something like that, 
the chances are they are actually sampling the audio and then doing the MFCC transform to hear what you're saying. So what we are doing is we're framing a signal into millisecond steps. Um, we do the Fourier transform, short time Fourier transform on that. We have a filter bank to convert that to the MEL scale. Um, and then we do a cosine transform and we find the MFCC. And MFCC stands for MEL frequency sepstrom coefficients. So you call it MFCC. And the way we, that we did this, that we found a open source library called Librosa. Super simple. All of these steps, just one line of code. Very nice. So how did it go? As I said, we're not done yet. These are the results as of today. Um, the first data set with the minimus bias, as I said, didn't go too well. This was the confusion matrix. So for classes zero to five, it could actually find where there was no person talking, but for the rest of them, it just guessed it all on three. And that is that it kind of got stuck trying to minimize the cost function, but it had no idea what was happening. Um, and there are a number of reasons to this. Maybe the MFCC transform didn't actually contain that much data about different voices that we had hoped, um, or it was just bad luck. So for the second data set, it got better. So here I'm showing again the mean absolute error, but only for one run. Uh, so <clears throat> the classes are on the x-axis. And as you can see, actually, it's pretty good. Um, it's, it's around zeros, uh, 1.5, uh, 1, uh, 1, 1. Uh, except for class 10, which is spiking. Um, still 3.5, it's not that bad, but we would want it around two, maybe three as a maximum. Um, and these are also the results that I ran this morning. Um, so we have some inconsistencies left to, to figure out. Uh, I mean, it doesn't look good that class 10 is just spiking up like that, but we don't know why yet. Uh, but if we're looking at the confusion matrix, it looks better. You can see a clear diagonal, which means that it actually did predict somewhere where it should or in the, in the near uh, neighbors of where it should. And the nice thing about using convolutional neural networks is that you can actually visualize what the network is seeing and classifying based upon. So this is an example of a heat map or grad cam. It's very hard to see up there. I realize that. <laughs> but basically, so for the MFCC, it's 30 coefficients um, long. And you can see some patterns where there are actually voice utterances because that is the phonemes that are being captured in the coefficients. And so what we are seeing here in the heat map is that it's actually looking at the first, I would say first 15 coefficients uh, very uh, a lot to try to classify uh, how many people are speaking. So we know that our network is actually looking at the right thing, uh, even though its classification is, well, it could be better. So we tried, we, we, uh, we have trained that model on our algorithmically built data. But what happens if we take that model and try to apply it on the actual coffee session? I mean, it's not perfect. Um, as I said, for classes one to six, we would want it around one, two at max. Uh, it spikes up pretty linearly to 3.5. And there are a number of reasons for this as well. So for example, for the, the data set that we built, the audiobooks, every person that reads in an audiobook will be sitting super close to a mic, right? And they will be speaking very clearly. That was not the case with our FICA session. So we had placed a mic, but some people were further away from that, resulting in a higher uh, signal to noise ratio. So maybe the, uh, the model thought it was actually noise instead of a person speaking, you get the idea. It's a, it's a bit of a problem here. But the main point is that this could actually be feasible for real life. Uh, we just have to build and annotate real life data sets. So 
my partner and I have been talking and thinking a lot about this. So one way we could do this um, is by having a room full of people, each people, each person gets one mic like I have right now. And then we have a mic in the middle. So we know when each person is speaking based off of their own mic, but then for training the models, we use the mic from the center. Maybe something like that, maybe just feeling the vibrations maybe a vibration sensor or something, I don't know. And also, are we counting nonverbal sounds? Like how do we do with laughter? Maybe some, someone is coughing. How do we know that's a new person or someone from before? It's very hard to tell, right? And also in this thesis, we have done basically no pre-processing of the signals at all. Uh, so there are a number of transforms you can do before you actually send the signal into the MFCC transform. That would be interesting to try and also test different models. I mean, I only tried the, the convolutional neural network, a very simple one at first, and then adding a bit more like batch normalization and stuff like that, you know? Um, but just keep trying, maybe a hyperparameter uh, optimization or something like that. And yeah, I think that was all for me. Questions? <laughs> uh, yeah during the data generation process yes uh, did you try uh changing the ampli ampli amplitude of the voices uh so that some were more silent and some were more loud to uh, simulate this yes we have been trying to kind of randomize that a bit but maybe we should try um I mean, we have set the background noise to a constant level, and then there's only a range of values in between that the voices will actually range uh, between the amplitude. So maybe, I don't know, increase that, increase the randomness of the, of the background noises uh, and stuff like that as well. Yeah. And actually it took a lot of time to do these data sets because there's so much that you have to think about. You don't want to have a model that is learning the wrong things. Uh, that we actually discovered using heat maps in the beginning. So I had done this data set of, I think about 500 samples for classes zero to five. And I thought I had randomized it all, but I hadn't. But then I got like really good results and like, but the, the confusion matrix looked almost inverted. Like the higher the class, the better the classification. I was like, mm, I don't know about that. And then I looked at the heat map and it actually showed that it was counting the number of clips in each sample instead of actually looking at the voices. So it was looking at the, the spaces in between utterances instead of the actual utterances, mm -hmm. because the more people are talking, the more clips there will be. So there's been a lot of work with these data sets. And I mean, they're better, but they're not, they're not perfect. I mean, we need real life data. And also the FICA session that we recorded, it was nine minutes ish like 583.7 seconds and that took my partner i think about four days to annotate between which samples not seconds between which samples someone is speaking and recognizing who is speaking and writing that down <laughs> i mean i didn't have to do it so i had fun <laughs> We were actually only six. Okay. So we only got the classes uh, one to six from that FICA session, yeah. uh, which is why it's, uh, it's uh, only up to six on the X axis. Yeah. And what we did was that we had, we had nine seconds and nine minutes. Um, so what we did when we took out samples was that we just, um, we had a hop length of three seconds. So we had one sample, one sample, one sample. So a lot of the samples are actually overlapping. Um, yeah, just to try to get some more because if we only take 15 seconds, we had 15 second long um, samples. If you only take them at a time, we got 37 test samples from the, we call this the gold standard data sets. But when we did like the overlapping ones, we had 194. And that's quite a big difference. Uh, especially if you are trying to get statistics out of uh, out of the data sets, such as overlapping, quiet time, blah, 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 and try to mirror that for uh, a data set with a thousand samples per class. Yeah. But 
That wasn't used for training. That no, it's that just testing. Only. Yeah. And do you think it, uh, that results are also because uh, the samples are taken <laughs> from basically one data, one test data set? Yeah. You make a lot of samples from one sample. Exactly. Okay. And I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of like wrong things about this in the way that um, the only statistics that we are basing this off is the culture that we have in our friend group. I mean, that is not at all representative of how, uh, I mean, a workplace would look or maybe other cultures or other like, friend, friend groups. So, I mean, everything is just like, we try it out, we see what happens. Yeah. How many audiobooks did you use? It's actually hard to tell because so this is a, a data set called LibriSpeech. And uh, so basically what it is that you, you download just a bunch of files, basically. And each speaker, I think, no, it doesn't say here. OK, so each speaker has like a, um, um, each speaker has a, has, a, has a number. And then it has like a folder with clips of varying length. And it could be part of an audiobook. It could be like some little novel of two sides. I mean, it doesn't, it's not entirely sure. But what we did was that we looked at the statistics of um, how much time each speaker got in the data set. And we made sure that no speaker was overrepresented. And the same between genders as well, making sure that there are equal amounts of uh, male and female voices represented in the data sets. Yes. Have you thought about trying to kind of not try, try to classify how many people are talking, but trying to create some kind of fingerprint of the voice so you can identify that, okay, here someone is speaking, I get this fingerprint, and here someone is speaking yeah. again, and now the, the fingerprint is too different, so this is another person. Yes, exactly. So that is what my partner has been doing. He has been using something called speaker diarization methods, uh, which is basically um, speaker diarization methods are used um, a lot of times to like annotate or analyze maybe a president's speech, maybe a meeting, like automatically. But that means oftentimes that you have to have that voice known before. Uh, so you have to know like, okay, so how would a typical uh, Trump sound like? And then you have an embedding for that and stuff like that. So he, he's working on that and he's using the metadata that I created for the data sets. Um, but the problem is that he kind of has to use the met metadata, but that's not feasible in reality because we don't know who's going to enter a room. Uh, but essentially what he does is that he trains a model on uh, speaker voices and then he creates embeddings for different utterances which means a vector that is representing what the person is saying and some attributes of, of the voice. And then he clusters that, and then he counts. How many clusters did I get from this 15 second clip? Which means that this is how many speakers there are. Yes. Uh, just, just another thought for, for this implementation at the home alarm system. You, you could actually have everyone who's living in the house record their voice so you get a fingerprint of them. And then you can check is any one of them in the room right mm. now speaking and if they are then everything is fine but if you hear a lot of voices that is none of, of the people uh, who lives there then you might that is a good point and the problem that comes with that is basically gdpr because that is biometric data of a person that then has to give consent to their voice being recorded and then saved at the device so like part of the the company's whole thing is that nothing will leave the device like the information that it collects it's used and then it's discarded and it never leaves the device uh, so that's part of like the security the aspect yeah. Thing, yeah and another thing is also that their main um, customer are like short time rentals so it's more like, okay, is there 26 people in a, an apartment for two? Or like, is there someone having a party? Uh, is there a break-in where like someone is there that shouldn't be there? You know, stuff like that. So it's more like a, if it's possible to, to use that, um, we'll see. I mean, my partner is not done with his part yet. So, yes. I can imagine that 
Amazon, Google, and the ones with uh, home speaker systems are leading this field, but it's nothing available. So basically, you're inventing the wheel again. Or how is how have you been able to to utilize the work? Um, we have not uh, looked that much into it. I mean, we just from the start kind of assume that okay, yeah, that's not gonna they're not gonna give us anything. Like we're working for a company, they don't really want to like help us just for the good of their nature. Um, so we kind of invented the wheel again, yes. And actually what's funny is that this approach with um, identifying speakers using convolutional nets and um, MFCC transform. So we started in February, in March, actually there was a uh, an article published in IEEE about the exact same thing. <laughs> so we were like, oh, okay, yeah, we, we started, when we started, it was actually something new, something that people hadn't really tried before, but yeah. Another thing you could use for test data is uh, on YouTube, you have like these uh, coffee dis discussions. Yeah. So you can kind of pick uh, some samples that are more realistic mm. from different YouTube uh, yeah. videos and stuff like that. Yeah, we started actually, uh, that was our first idea of how to build a data set was to like scrape YouTube and then just um, uh, like try building something with that. But then we actually um, realized that the data set that Audio Labs, like our baseline data had built on was free and available. So we just went with that. Yeah. Is this device going to be connected to the internet in order to be able to I mean, send away snippets of audio data to, to do some, I mean, do calculations on, on the server, or is it supposed to be done? It's on the device. On so the, yes, so that's another thing we had to like bear in mind was that since it's a very small device, it has um, memory constraints. So we wanted the model to be as small and lightweight as possible. That's also partly uh, the reason why we use the MFCC transform instead of, for example, short time free transform at a whole, because that one, when you want a good uh, resolution, can get very, very heavy. And having that type of model with that many parameters, it's not going to work because then that model would just take over the memory. So yeah. How small is small in this example? How much memory do you have there? I mean, the instructions we were given was basically as small as you can, and it's still like, like as small as you can while it's still producing um, good results. Okay. So um, <laughs> we were like, okay. <laughs> uh, so that's why we started the baseline with um, like three uh, convolutional layers. We were like, okay. I mean, if it works, it works, and it ish worked for the baseline. And so that's what where we have been trying to stay. But then again, we thought, like I guess you always do with a master thesis, you think you're gonna get somewhere very quickly. And then like we had ideas of like, you know, transforming this to C and then running it on the device and you know having demos and everything. Uh, but uh, as of now, where we are ending is oh, it's probably helpful, maybe. So we didn't actually get into like the actual memory question, yeah. Uh, is there a possibility to tweak the specification a little bit of, of the task? Like, instead of trying to define, is it 10 or 15 people in the room who say that, is it one, two, three, or many? Yeah, exactly, yes. That uh, is uh, one. Uh, it's eight or 15. Exactly. Uh, give or take. Exactly. So, so a part of it was that we thought we would do like higher resolution maybe for lower classes. And then as we go up, because the, uh, uh, the mean uh, absolute error will be increasing anyways. We just thought, okay, let's let's just uh, put together like class 10 to 15 and then 15 to 20 and then 20 plus. Uh, and yet again, we have as of now only classes um, zero to 10. So, I mean, sure, we could do that. It's just a matter of like relabeling the, the samples. It takes very little time, but yeah, that is definitely like uh, an option that will be and maybe on the device later. Could you, <clears throat> this is a boring question, but could you return to this slide where you had this um, open source uh, library? Yeah, Librosa. Before I would just like to take a drink. What was Librosa. It's uh, apparently a very um, common uh, open source library for audio analysis. Yep.
Yeah. Talking yeah. about the heat map of yeah. how the phonemes are actually, I mean, where you spot the, uh, the differences. Yeah. yeah. Can you see that there are like. The bottom one. Or, yeah. Yeah. I mean, is there an ideal um, pattern that how this should look for if you have a specific sound or a specific word, for example? Is there an idea or pattern that should be? I mean, so this is. <laughs> This is just numbers, essentially. So what we're doing here is just um, showing the numbers with the, OK, now we don't have the the actual um, color bar. But it's very non-intuitive to um, to see what this is supposed to be. I mean, basically, what you can say is um, if there's just like white noise, like here, you can't really see anything. So you guess no one is talking, but then when you see, I don't know if you can see that, but it looks like ripples. Then you can basically say, oh, someone is talking. Probably, maybe. Uh, so that's basically as far as you can go as to like uh, um, looking at the, the heat map and then decoding the pattern. Yeah. This also makes me think about frequencies in voices because we have, mm -hmm. I mean, the total span of, of frequencies in one, one voice yes. can be totally different. Mm -hmm. And if, even if you add two or three, the, both the amplitude, but also the frequency span is going to increase. But that is not really, is that taken into account in the MFC? So, so what is, uh, the, the male scale essentially is um, a scale that was developed to, to mimic the human ear. And the human ear is uh, like developed to um, hear and understand human voice. Right. So we are uh, by doing the um, the filter bank. The filter bank will actually um, increase the uh, uh, some frequencies and make a high resolution for some frequencies that we know that voices are within, and then a lower uh, resolution for for frequencies that normally don't contain any voice activity. So. That is like the whole package of MFCC. That's where that is taken into account. Yes. So, but also trying to, um, trying to, I mean, the y axis here, trying to decode that and understand what that means, it's very hard. So, normally for speaker recognition tasks, you only use the first 13 rows. You see, there's like two rows at the bottom, green and uh, red and blue there are these are 30 rows because we thought let's just keep a lot of data uh, but normally you only use like the first 12 or 13 because that's where the voice is and that's where you're going to find the information about what the utterance is yeah i mean yes probably so what they're setting is one device and some people having large homes or rentals have several devices. So it would be possible to actually um, like maybe make them collaborate. But then again, if it's... Did you see the tenant component analysis so you will filter out, if you have several microphones, you filter out the different types of sound yeah. across the device, and then you can create a, a convolution on it, try and see, like, decide is this Someone speaking, mm. someone speaking, mm. speaking. Yeah. But I think you need one microphone for each type of sound. So uh -huh. having 10 people, then you would need at least 10 microphones. Yeah. And it would probably be tricky, but I think uh, for maybe two or three, uh, you could get yeah. maybe a good result. Yeah. 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 Then in the sample system, you know, saying that this microphone is written only to this person, mm -hmm. and this one is written to this one, so don't listen to that one. No, no, yeah. the, 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 the algorithm would filter that out on, on Supervise. So it will, um, I did it in school actually yeah. with two voices sort of speaking over each other. So uh, we implemented it in C and we had a small switch so you could switch from back and forth. Yeah. So it would sound like you would still hear the other person, mm. but it would be uh, uh, filtered out quite a lot. So one person would be very, very clear and the other one would be very. Um, the, 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 almost the, the how do you know which mic is taking which voice? Because you have like 10 people, you have like three microphones, uh, mm -hmm. three, and you need, uh, they're all on the edge. So you don't know which one is uh, picking this running from the 
but you don't need to know which one. You just need to know if it's a person for each. Okay. So you get yeah. different channels. All right. And yeah. let's say if you have 10 microphones, you'll, you'll make 10 channels. If uh, channel 5 to 10 <coughs> are just uh, white noise or no noise or no sound, then okay. the, your convolution is necessary. So this is not perfect. Mm. So you need both algorithms to work together. Well, we did try, um, speaking of like, um, is there a person talking or not? We did try a double classifier. So first we just sent in uh, like samples where there were two classes. So is someone speaking or is someone not speaking? And then based off of that, it will classify the rest of the classes. And, but yeah, it, it, it turned out it, we didn't need the double classifier uh, in the end, but yeah. All right, any more questions? Take the time. <laughs> Ten minutes, and we do yeah. our last three ones. Or do you want to continue? I mean, it's also a question. Oh, working here. Do we want to just, you know, fill up your glasses with the wine or Coca-Cola or coffee? I don't know. And then we maybe should do another three directly. Or do you want to? Sure. Yeah. Small baby one. Small baby one. Stretch yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Det är 
Yeah. 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 Nu byter man förresten. Uh, ta. Hmm. Har du någon aning om man byter slides? Jag kan inte få det att funka. Uh, förlåt, jag vet inte vad jag gör. Uh, jag vill bara, uh, om jag ska byta bild, vad gör jag? Högerpil så får du nästa. Om du är i presentationsläge. Ska vi se. Space. Eller vänsterklick kanske. Ja, men då, men det gör vi så här. Vad har hänt här? Ja, nu funkar det. Så. Ja, men funkar det för att klicka lite hårdare. Yes, okej. Okay. Ja, det ser man då. Okay, so shall we? Uh, so uh, I want to start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is David, and I'm a junior data scientist at uh, Nordaxon, and I'm currently a consultant at uh, Sony. Uh, my background is in engineering physics at LTH. Uh, I still haven't uh, finished my master thesis, but I plan to do it uh, soon. Mm. And I would like to say that uh, I, I really enjoy the process of creating ML solutions, and especially when you can try out uh, new technologies, which uh, uh, you can read in papers. So the purpose of my presentation is that I want to share a little bit about Edge AI. Uh, the things I've learned at Sony for for the past three months that I've worked there, and uh, I hope that uh, this will help you in the in your future projects uh, if you're working with Edge AI or something similar. So, I would like to start by asking, um, what is AI on the edge? Uh, and uh, one definition is that. Uh, the AI algorithm is processed locally on uh, your device. Uh, and uh, the data that is gathered is also gathered on the device. For instance, uh, we all have a phone and some of the phones, they have a facial recognition uh, when you need to unlock the phone. The sensor that takes your face, uh, which is on the phone and the algorithm that processes and make the decision is also on the phone. Nothing, you can do this without connection to the Wi-Fi or internet. So uh, that's one definition. Also, uh, mm, another example can be self-driving cars. Um, they need to detect people pretty fast on the road. They don't have time to send the data up to the cloud and uh, back again, the decision. It, has to make. Everything has to be processed locally. Mm. So uh, uh, why is edge AI important? Why is it important to uh, uh, do this? Well, basically, mm, the number of devices which are going to do this is going to increase. Uh, all our devices are getting more intelligent. And uh, uh, I have also uh, gathered two sources here, uh, one from Gartner and one from Traktika. Uh, and Gartner, they predict that the number of uh, AI uh, devices, AI edge devices, it will increase from around uh, 
161 uh, million units uh, up to uh, 2.6 billion by 2025. Uh, and uh, also the data that is uh, processed. Uh, today, around 90% of it is processed in the cloud. Uh, but in the future, uh, by 2025, uh, they predict, Gartner predicts that it will go up to 75%. So uh, this is important. Uh, why is it uh, important? Um, also, uh, as I said before, it allows for operations in real time. It is very important, for instance, uh, in self-driving cars, uh, where uh, latency is unwanted. If you have a pedestrian in front of the car, you want the car to make a decision fast uh, in case an uh, accident can occur. Uh, and also uh, AI-based drones. If the drone is mm, like falling down, it needs to correct itself. Uh, but there are the algorithms that can use this. Bus. But if you use AI, then it needs to be on the device. That's the point. And also, if you have a general purpose AI, like a T-800 from Terminator 2, <laughs> it needs to make decisions fast and protect people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what am I doing at Sony? Basically, we're working with uh, the Sony camera reference system. It's a system uh, environment that enables developers to test and try out their applications uh, with Sony's automotive sensors, uh, for instance, in self-driving cars. Mm. It uh, basically, it consists of three components. It's a Sony deserialized board, uh, Sony camera modules, and uh, the NVIDIA Jetson AGX Xavier, which is like an, it's an embedded device with like a GPU in it, and uh, you can uh, deploy very powerful uh, algorithms on it. Uh, for instance, object detection, very heavy uh, object detection systems. And uh, these can be used, for instance, in manufacturing, uh, delivery, retail, and smart cities, and more. And uh, in this image here, I show for in uh, object detection. So it detects traffic lights and cars bicycles and the image above there that's the Xavier which I talked about so uh, uh, what I've been doing at Sony specifically is uh, uh, we, we trained our own object detection system uh, to detect Swedish traffic signs as a proof of concept um, and uh, then we plan to, we haven't, we haven't gone to step two yet, but we plan to deploy it on the Sony camera reference system. And uh, uh, another purpose is that we want to compare different camera modules uh, by uh, comparing the model performance in each camera. Uh, So uh, that basically sums up what I'm doing at Sony. And uh, um, now I would like to go into a more technical part of uh, the presentation. Uh, I don't expect you to understand everything, but uh, I will try to explain as much as I can uh, and answer questions after the presentation. Um, and hopefully you will learn something. So. Uh, the object detection system that we used is trained on two data sets mainly. Uh, the first da training data set is uh, Lean, Lean Shopping's traffic sign data set, consists of around 2,000 uh, images, annotated images of uh, Swedish traffic signs. And uh, for our use case, uh, we wanted it to detect cars and pedestrians and dogs and cats as well. Uh, which can appear in the road. So that data set was not enough. So we also included uh, this uh, large scale data set called COCO, 
uh, and uh, uh, it is it is generally I think it's bad practice to combine two data sets because uh, it doesn't represent the real distribution uh, which the model will train on so but we tried it anyway uh, to see how well it will perform and also if you look below the lean shopping uh, traffic standard set I have written 50,000 unlabeled images uh, we also tried out unsupervised uh, semi-supervised learning and we wanted to compare it with supervised learning and see how well it performs mm. so uh, and we the model we used it's YOLO version 3 it is one of the fastest object detection system that is also lightweight uh, that uh, mm, is uh, one of the state-of-the-arts uh, models for object detection and uh, uh, the model you can see up there uh, that's architecture <laughs> you don't have to understand it and this is what it produced um, so I would like to share with you our findings uh, what we discovered while we trained this model so uh, the first comparison there is uh, uh, we compared semi-supervised training with supervised training. Um, so uh, basically, uh, the difference there is uh, that semi-supervised training, I mean, uh, first I have to explain semi-supervised training. So semi-supervised training is that you have, you have the right answer and the input data, uh, and then you uh, feed it through the black box and get an output, then you train the model. Uh, by minimizing the error but with semi-supervised learning you also have another data set which is unlabeled uh, so uh, by using unlabeled images in the training data we managed to increase the performance from 0 0.43 to 0 0.448 uh, uh, MAP MAP is like uh, you can think of it as accuracy as of now. Um, for uh, it is quite complicated to explain. Mm, so, uh, well, <laughs> I I don't think I have time to explain exactly the pipeline that we used when we did semi supervised learning, but uh, I can tell tell it to you uh, during the question. And um, also another finding that we did was that the size of the training image it affects the inference so uh, apparently the model performs better at the resolution it is trained on so uh, in our data set we had images that were around uh, 640 times 320 but after training we try to predict we use the model to predict on high resolution images and intuitively, we think that high resolution, high resolution images, it should it contain more information, right? Therefore, the model should predict better, but it didn't. Uh, the model performed better at low resolution images. So if we have a res high resolution camera and we downsize the images, the model will perform better. Very <laughs> counterintuitive. <laughs> so uh, this is, uh, this is, we think this is uh, because uh, that uh, the model we use, YOLO version 3, it has a bias towards uh, the size of the object in the image. So, uh, and, and uh, recently they have uh, announced a new model, uh, YOLO v3, uh, four, sorry, YOLO version 5 and 4. They actually released at the same time, but uh, they said that YOLO version 5, it actually solved this problem. Uh, by with the addition of a certain type of network called capsule network layer. You don't exactly have to understand what it does, but you can look it up afterwards. Mm. So these are our findings. Mm. And lastly, I would like to introduce you to two frameworks that we plan to use for deployment, uh, which are both NVIDIA fr uh, frameworks. The first one is called TensorRT. 
it is basically basically a framework for uh, uh, representing a model in uh, another format that is compatible with NVIDIA GPUs. And uh, it facilitates high performance inference. So uh, there's a trick they use that to, in order to increase the speed. So uh, there's something called int 8 quantization, uh, which can speed up your model by four times. And uh, basically, it means that you, you perform the calculations in lower resolution. Um, normally, when we train a model, we train the models with uh, numbers that are 32 bits long. Uh, but with int 8 quantization, you reduce them to 8 bits. But you also use certain tricks to account for the loss of accuracy. So that's TensRT. Another framework, DeepStream. Uh, it's a very good uh, framework for deploying AI-powered frameworks for video analytics. Mm, and with it, you can, with with DeepStream, you can achieve pretty high throughput. Uh, for instance, for object detection and image classification. Mm. Uh, for instance, uh, if you combine these two frameworks, you can gain an inference speed of uh, 319 frames per second uh, with the model Dashcam Net ResNet 18 uh, with a very high resolution uh, of about 960-544 on the Xavier. I would like to end my presentation with a meme. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Have you tried your uh, your look uh, once uh, version five? I mean, uh, you haven't yet. Have you tried it out? Uh, not yet, actually, okay. because the it it will be. Uh, complicated when we want to deploy it on the on our device uh, it currently it supports yolo version 3 if we want to implement version yolo 5 we have to uh, implement it ourselves so it will take quite some time so we haven't tried it out yet but maybe in the future mm. so this platform where you're gonna compare different camera sets in the end um what what kind of features in the camera? I mean, in the camera in itself, or in the camera chipset, would you be looking for when you compare them? So, say that you have one camera performing better than the other. Mm -hmm. What kind of feature is it that you're actually going to be pinpointing it on? So you can compare different aspects in the camera. For instance, you can compare the ability for the camera to. Um, for instance, there's a situation uh, where you can measure the camera's uh, ability to switch from light condition when it's dark. Then you turn out the lights. The camera has to uh, adapt itself because if it don't, then the image will, it will be like blurry first, but then it will uh, be dark. Some, some cameras are basically faster in this aspect, while others, uh, maybe they don't, Think about this, then it will look bad. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, there are many more different aspects that you can compare. Mm. For instance, uh, objects far away, then it's basically res resolution. And even uh, white balance or color correctness. Mm. Basically, basically that. Mm. Mm. Yes, yeah, so regarding a uh, question regarding Yolo. Yeah. So that's like an open source image recognition module. But you can add additional training to that one, which you did with the Swedish model, with the Swedish uh, world graphic sign package. So like you, you, you have Yolo, and then you add on top of that your own training. Is that how it works? Or? Uh, <laughs> sorry, do you mean that uh, how our pipeline? training pipeline is constructed. Yeah. Uh, so basically we have YOLO version three. It's a neural network. Right. 
and uh, with the neural network we have training data uh, which we've trained the model with uh, and as the lean shopping traffic sign that set is a, it's a data set oh sorry sorry uh, uh, we actually did transfer learning so we start with the original yolo weights which the original author has uh, has uh, yeah mm. exactly <laughs> and it saves time a lot of time how much data have been using? No, I mean, you said uh, 2,500 from the uh, in traffic and 10,000 uh, that you've been. I know you've been collecting data as well, haven't you? Actually, that's, that was a restriction uh, when I asked my manager if we could collect data. They said, no, we are not interested in, lab in human labor. <laughs> 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 so uh, I have I've been trying to think about methods to increase the improve the data set or increase the size of the data set yeah. algorithmically yeah. maybe synthesize synthesize data set by by taking a background image and then cropping <laughs> <laughs> cropping objects onto it like a car or a traffic sign yeah. and uh, it didn't work well because yeah i did it very you can you can go deeper into that but yeah i didn't approach that uh, path that much yeah but uh what was successful was semi-supervised learning. We used unlabeled images, uh, basically. So, so after our first training iteration with the original training data set, we used the original model to predict bounding boxes on the unlabeled data set. And uh, then uh, we developed another algorithm to take each bounding box, crop them, and uh, uh basically we developed a correction algorithm in order to correct uh the these these bounding boxes so that they are not false positives because the model is is not accurate right it, we cannot guarantee that it's accurate so yeah so basically we we annotated the the unlabeled images uh with our original model and then we trained it on these images again uh yeah, basically that. But you need like, you know, accuracy measurement with MPA something. Can you explain that kind of, uh, yeah, that one. MAP. Yeah, yeah. So uh, MAP stands for mean accuracy precision. Uh, precision is uh, a metric uh, where you compare the, like, out of all your guesses, how many are correct. Um, for bounding boxes, it's it's quite difficult to use the metric accuracy. Uh, so you could say that MAP, MAP, it's it's like accuracy. Uh, yeah, I, I'm working a bit about that as well. And hmm? I think it's about the um, the overlap of a predicted uh, bounding box compared to the labeled bounding box. And if you say that it predict and the if the overlap is above maybe fifty percent, you say that it is classified as as that in that bounding box. Uh -huh. So the the overlap of the bounding boxes with with an accuracy of an yeah correct class as well. Okay, and I see what you are trying to find is okay. Yeah. Yeah. What is an acceptable number? Uh, what is the goal? The goal is to get to one, right. yeah, zero to one. So the higher the better, mm, just like accuracy. Um, but one MAP, I don't think it actually uh, guarantees that uh, the model is performing well. You have to look at other metrics as well, like F1 score and the recall, and look at the actual matrix itself uh, to determine if the model is good. Uh, because one M one one imprecision means that uh, out of all the guesses, um, I might be wrong, but I think uh, one MAP 
if you make zero guesses, uh, then all your correct all your predictions are correct, right? You haven't made any predictions at all. So uh, you have to look at other metrics as well, not only AMAP. What was the hardest part of the project in the start? Was it getting the uh, caveat in, uh, in, uh, in place and all the environment? Uh, if you, you know, when you start a project, I, I know you got a lot of guesses and everything. What was the hardest part? Uh, Mm. Uh, when we have to deploy it, uh, we uh, I'm affiliate, I'm very experienced with the uh, Python language, <laughs> program language. So uh, I had to learn a new program language in order to uh, uh, deploy it, uh, to understand how to deploy it in uh, C plus plus. So uh, it it was challenging for for me. It was challenging to orientate in the documentation. It's pretty much to go through but uh yeah as a junior uh, this is expected but yeah i'll manage <laughs> and uh the challenge also was the data we had very little data so uh it was also fun but challenging to come up with these data generation methods <laughs> mm. yeah i mean I'm a bit interested in the, the YOLO uh, uh, network. Like it, I, I'm thinking that the, the YOLO is a fast method, mm. but, but when you just the, uh, you showed this, uh, the, the structure of the framework, it looked a bit complicated. It looked more complicated than I thought it would be. So it, can you just like summarize what the YOLO does in that framework? Uh, so you don't have to go through everything. <laughs> so so basically, YOLO version 3 is a little bit different from all the other object detection systems. It's called a single shot, uh, single shot uh, object detection system. Uh, other other uh, systems usually are two stage. So uh, in YOLO version 3, we have, uh, we basically predict, uh, um, like it outputs, it outputs a grid. And each grid contains numbers. You can think of it as numbers. And the higher the number is, the greater the uh, it. The, the higher the number, the larger probability there is an object in that box. Mm, so, so for instance, uh, the YOLO model will output this grid, and it says one here, but zero every, everywhere else. It means that the uh, object is localized there. And then in the same box, you have uh more numbers where you can identify which class it thinks it is and how large the bounding box is uh, and uh, in the beginning of the network you have a convolutional base which is a pre-trained uh, convolutional neural network which uh, can capture all the spatial information in the image uh, that someone else has trained for several weeks and you can switch that uh, back part uh, with uh, whatever uh, convolutional base that you want to. Mm. So in YOLO 5, they redesigned all this <laughs> with this thing called, uh, mm, in this slide. Oh no. <laughs> Capsule something. Capsule, yeah, capsule neural network, <laughs> yeah, which which can take into account the spatial information better than normal convolutional neural networks. When we ran the Yolo V3 on a, like a standard laptop, we had a FPS of like zero point five or something, and we ran it live. I mean, what what kind of FPS were you getting on the Favier, and what would be acceptable in a in a car um, application? I would say. Uh, there's not an exact number, but I would say about 30, maybe, uh, depending on the size of the model and the size of the image that you decided to use. Uh, yeah, but you can achieve pretty high FPS uh, with the Xavier. Mm. You can also feed 16 cameras into the Xavier at the same time <laughs> and get high FPS. <laughs> yeah. So then a solution would be to have one central system and then just add channels of cameras in all the interactions. It will handle them all. 
there's actually a matrix you can look at to see the different models uh, and what how 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 different the uh, different FPSs are uh, for different image sizes. So, and from that you can decide uh, which one you want, how you want to design your data set, and uh, how the real situation inference will be will look like. Thank you. Det är intressant i animationen. Jag lite. Ja. Ja, okej. Hello, my name is Jacob. I'm going to talk about object detection as well and uh, text recognition. And this is a project I've been working on, which, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, mainly about information extraction actually. So just uh, a bit of uh, myself. I'm also studying engineering physics, just like David and Isabella. Uh, I'm focusing on machine learning and statistics. And since this February, I've been working on, at Alpha Laval on a project, uh, which I'm now also continuing on this summer. And, and before I start uh, presenting that project, I have to just uh, say a bit al about Alpha Laval so you know the, uh, the background. Uh, they're a big industrial company. They uh, work with fluid handling, separation, energy transfer. They're old, very old, and meaning that they have a bit of an old mindset from time to time, but they're learning. So they're not really used to data handling, for example. And I work at the Department of uh, Service at uh, the gasketed plate heat exchangers. And that is what you can see there. Maybe. Uh, basically, it's big metal machines, and they have a lot of thin plates stacked together and fluids run through them. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's what I'm going to say. And uh, well, these machines, they, are, they have very good quality. So good quality that today, maybe a customer can come and say, we bought a machine 40 years ago. Now we're starting to have some troubles with it. What should we do? So they come to the service uh, department, and we have to know a bit more about the machine. So we say, yeah, what serial number do, do you have? Well, may, hopefully they have a serial number. And when they have a serial number, we have to find the document uh, that describes this machine, basically. Now, these documents were usually in a uh, physical archive. Someone ran down and looked through documents. Was it this one? No, it wasn't going through, yeah, hours of work. Now they are digitalized, meaning they are in PDF format. And uh, <laughs> they're, they're not always ordered in a good way. So it can still take a long time to actually find the correct document. And when one finds the correct document, one has to find the, the relevant information in that document. So that is why where I come in. I've been working on information extraction from the documents. And I see there's a typo there, whatever. And uh, I cannot really show you the documents or uh, all the details about the work I've been doing, unfortunately, as it uh, belongs to Alpha Laval. But uh, what I can tell you is these documents, they are very old. It can be from the 70s, 80s, 90s. And some of them have very bad quality when they were scanned uh, into a PDF format or just single image images uh, together in a pile. Um, when they were scanned, they can have like shadowy edges. They can be skewed. Maybe one page is skewed, another is not skewed. 
and there's no real uh, clear structure of the documents. They can be, they can really vary in the layout or yeah, how they look. And there are a lot of them, hundreds of thousands. So, and what I want to extract from this is serial numbers. And those are the, the, yeah, the numbers that are connected to each machine. They can be written implicitly on a document, uh, meaning that you could say uh, serial number, blah, 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 001, 2005. So it contains a lot of numbers in between. Um, it also, what I also want to extract is the article numbers. And that is the, uh, each plate in, uh, for example, in one of these machines. There are a type of plate. One wants to find out what kind of plate this is or other products in this entire machine. And all of these products has a number. And I want to find out how many articles are in this machine. So it can be, yeah, it's a machine with this serial number and there are 10 plates of this kind, which with this number, there are 20 plates with this number and so on. So that is what I want to find. However, the documents contain a lot more information than that. And there are a lot of tables specifically in the, in the documents. And I will talk more about that. Um, so this is what I got from Alpha Laval. Do what you want. Uh, we don't care how you do it, just try to do it. So what I think is fun about this project is that I actually now managed to find like the, the machine learning part that I am getting into was the way that actually solved my problem. It's not that I was told, do machine learning with this uh, algorithm to actually solve our problem. That, that was not on my mind to begin with, but I actually find the machine learning solutions, which was very fun. Now, some of you might think that, wait a minute, this problem is easy. We only use text recognition. Uh, something called optical character recognition. Google has uh, developed something called Tesseract. Um, yeah, and it can identify characters in documents, basically. And I, and I use that partly, uh, Google Tesseract 4. And I, uh, it doesn't only have the uh, convolutional neural network background, it also has a recurrent LSTM that goes through the document line by line to get a better, better result. However, the, uh, the OCR is sensitive to when it comes to bad quality of the input. Uh, the shadowy edges can actually affect what it reads. It's very sensitive to structured text, tables, for example, especially if the tables are surrounded by other text. So even if it reads this in the right way, it makes it very difficult to parse. Uh, especially if one wants to find the connection between different numbers. And it's also sensitive to when a lot of text is to be uh, read at the same time. Like when an entire page is read at the same time, it can actually read the numbers in the wrong way. So the output is still a number and it might be a article number that exists, but it's not the one that says in the document. And that's not what, you want, what we want. <laughs> that's very bad, especially if all of this is going to be put into a yeah, SQL database, for example, so to be easily yeah, searched for later. And another thing, which the biggest problem actually, is that the data is ambiguous. And what I mean by that is, as I said, there are a lot of tables in the documents. And what is a common table in the, docu in the documents. They're not in all of the documents, of course. Why would there be? But um, it can say that, well, here is a product with this article number, and it is the first product that we put in. The second product, so we write a one there, and then we write a two, and we write another article number, and then we write a three, so it's the order of what they put the, the articles in with the article numbers. And if one only looks at now, I don't, I don't have a whiteboard, otherwise I would write it here. But uh, if one only looks at that table, one might think that, oh, there's a one here connected to an article number. 
And a two to that article number. Oh, that must be the quantities then. No, it's not. It's just the order that they come in. And there are a number of those kinds of tables that have quantity number features, but they're not the quantities. And I want to find the quantities connected to the articles. However, in all the documents, there is a summarizing table, the parts list, usually in the end of the document that says, okay, here are these article numbers and here are the quantities. So basically the most easy thing I thought was if we can just find this table in all the documents and do the OCR on that table only. So that is what I did. Uh, and I did that with a mosk RCNN uh, framework, which uh, uh, this it's developed by Facebook and the Facebook's AI group, open source. And basically, uh, it's an implementation of the faster RCNN framework where it, uh, it takes a regional proposal network where it finds like the, the regions of interest in an image. It goes out through some convolutional layers to classify what class this is. And then it has one thing as well, which is called the mask. And I'm not really sure if you can see that, but here's an image where one can see the bounding boxes that David talked about before. Uh, and even I can't really see that here, but uh, above each box, there's a confidence level where it says, this is a person with confidence 97, for example. And there's also this mask, which shows this color of where this object is. So it goes through the image pixel by pixel and just marks and segments the images to yeah, identify where the objects are. And I did this uh, by uh, uh, 500 training images, 50 validation images and 100 test images. Um, and I said that there are two classes only, background and the correct table, the parts list that I'm interested in. And I did this with not that much data, basically to see if my idea would work. And I didn't really have any high hopes to begin with. Um, and my initial thought was also that I should need more than two classes. I would also need a class for the, the wrong table to, so I can classify what I don't want. Uh, but then uh, another person said, well, skip that and just, yeah, la just to label uh, less, basically, and, uh, and see what you get, see how good it is. And uh, so I did that. And then you might also think that using the mosk RCNN is overkill when you have two classes only, and, uh, or basically one yeah, major class. You might be right. However, uh, this mask is actually pretty good when debugging the model or evaluating the model. When it sees another table and classifying another table as the correct one, I can see where it actually, it's kind of like the heat map thing. Uh, and what you don't see in this framework is that a lot of this is computated uh, in parallel. So the mask part doesn't really add that much uh, computational power or time. And uh, it was also very easily implemented from an open source framework. So I just, yeah, use that. And for those of you who are, who are interested, it's uh, yeah, a stochastic gradient descent optimizer with momentum, pretty small learning rate, weight decay, and the, uh, it has a residual neural network as the backbone. Now for the interesting parts. I cannot show you the exact results, but I will, well, kind of. Uh, here, this is not an Alpha Laval document, but this is what it would look like. Uh, it actually marks a table with a confidence level and like a mask. I'm doing this on CPU power right now. It's extremely slow. 
each epoch takes about uh, eight hours. Uh, it's yeah, I do it on a uh, laptop, CPU power. Uh, <laughs> so and we're <laughs> I'm waiting to get uh, Microsoft Azure's AI platform to actually yeah, but it has to go through this Alpha Laval IT <laughs> formal thing. Uh, <laughs> but the interesting thing is, even when the uh, uh, yeah, I did four epochs, and when I say that when you classify more tables than one, take the table that has the highest confidence and say that is the predictor class. Then I got the 97% uh, accuracy of correct uh, of the uh, classifying the correct table in a document. And I got the IOU metric, and that is connected to the MAP. It is the intersection over union. So it's the uh, overlap of bounding boxes, basically, of 83%, which is pretty good uh, when thinking that this is not a complete model. This is nowhere near a complete model. This is just a very simple model. And then I uh, just to see if the idea con uh, is working as well, just I uh, do the OCR on just the predicted bounding boxes. And the result is ex so much better. It actually works. And however, I need some uh, GPU power to actually yeah, continue training. The, I could show you some loss graphs, but they're, yeah, they're four data points right now, so it's not that interesting. And just continues to go down, so that's good. Um, and yeah, so what I need to be sure of is that the predicted bounding boxes uh, don't cut off the relevant information. So it can still, oh, an uh, overlap of 80% uh, is pretty good. Well, that depends where the overlap is. Uh, say, for example, that we have the an uh, article uh, in the parts list, uh, this article, and there's 511 of these uh, articles. And I cut off the five, and I put in the database that there's 11 of these. Then the uh, error is pretty big. So things like that has to be considered. But just, yeah, I'm in the midst of training. And the results were a lot better than I thought they would be of just doing a, pretty much a baseline model. So uh, yeah, that is pretty much it. Thank you for listening. Any questions and thoughts? So you actually knew it's very unstructured data you had, so you have files. Yes. You actually knew where you didn't know actually where this table is. You know it was a table at least. Yeah. So we're looking for not uh, so it's a it's text in a table. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. So did you know where on the table at least? Did they what no, I had to uh, label myself the uh, uh, six hundred and fifty images uh, yeah. using a uh, la labeling tool. So for three days. I drew bounding boxes. So there's some kind of pattern to the serial numbers, you know, like you, know, you have to count, like it's always five numbers, and yeah. Yes, the serial numbers, yeah. they, uh, they always begin with a one, with a certain number. So that was, uh, that part was, uh, I could do like with regular expressions and uh, yeah, do a system. Uh, so that I didn't have to do like uh, machine learning to, to extract. And uh, and all the serial numbers and all the article numbers, uh, I got them in an Excel file. Just here are all the ones that exist. So I uh, I did that, uh, converted all the Excel files into SQL uh, databases, so I can in the script uh, search. Okay, now in this document I have found this number. Is this a number that exists? So the confidence level at least increases. Yeah. So you had only like 600 documents. Is there any more data? I mean, is it only those 600 documents? Or no, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of documents. So there, there are, there is more. So this, uh, I can annotate more. Yeah.
Yeah. Uh, just for error correction, uh, there might be some year number or something on the page where you, so you know how old the document is, and you know that within this year we have this range of serial number being created or printed. Perhaps that could be used as some kind of validation for. Perhaps I haven't thought about that. I'm not really sure if Alpha Level have has that information themselves, uh, because they're yeah, they're, it's a big company that has uh, been uh, yeah they have bought smaller companies and those companies have other serial numbers as well. So yeah, it, it might be a mix up. Anyway. Yeah, it might be a mix up. Yeah. Are you rotating the bounding boxes? Before you do the recognition? Yes, there is an uh, I, I set like a, a data augmentation in the uh, the process when training, uh, but otherwise, um, yeah, other, otherwise when just predicting, there it's they're not rotated. Mm -hmm. Permissions only pick out the serial number, nothing else. Um, Sorry. The, the mission is only to take out the, the serial number. Uh, and the article numbers and the quantities. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in the article numbers, uh, it usually says that this is uh, uh, this kind of machine, like a, a unit type, for example. Is there a specific reason for you wanting the, uh, the amount? Um, yes, the, it is. Um, for example, I, I'm not sure about all the details in the heat exchangers themselves, but for example, there could be a, uh, a heat exchanger with uh, uh, maybe 300 stainless steel plates, but then there are 10 uh, titan plates or titanium plates. And when this, and then the customer says we have this specific error, and the product expert would say, hmm, this is probably because of the titanium plates. And then I know there are 10 of them. So I can just order 10 spare parts and send that to the uh, service provider. Uh, do you want to create a database where you have actually the specification of the contents of each machine yeah. uh, in the database as well? It, it is a, it's meant to be a, um, a tool to help the uh, salespeople and the service salespeople to, to order say, spare parts. Right. I thought it was primarily to, to identify where the document was and then you can read the document. No. No, okay. No, no they, this is uh, like, yeah, you should just like write in the serial number, uh, hit enter, and then you see what uh, what products are in this. And then you can say order if you want to. Mm. But are you the only one working on this? Yes. Because it seems like a huge, like, I know. benefit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm the only one. Must be tired, tired some to sort of like constant debate. Big, yes, big th that's why I'm so glad to be here to actually <laughs> be able to use other people to that know machine learning in another way. Do you have a technical understanding in the company or in the, the support you need? Or well, my uh, yeah, my uh, uh, I have t t two uh, managers and they are very understanding. And they yeah, uh, when I say that uh, well, I need GPU power, for example, then they are very supportive of trying to get that. So. Um, it's just that the uh, organization in, in itself is not used to this kind of work. So for example, I, yeah, I program a lot in the Python. I need to install a lot of uh, packages and so on. To do that, I need to be the local admin on a computer. And, and Alpha Laval is not really used to workers being the local admin on a computer. So uh, th this Monday when I was working, they had removed me as local admin, just like in a regular cleaning process. So that that, that is yeah, just basically yeah, things in there. What are you doing? We've been involved in a project that you won uh, for a while for the customer yeah. prediction. We were allowed to run uh, things in Azure. Yeah. <laughs> that was like 2017, Yeah. 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 But, but that was not inside our profile. That no, was in a breakout group that was yeah. uh, made only to do like uh, innovative, innovative things. things. Yeah. yeah. So they, they had special rights to yes, do yes, any yes, innovative things. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. so but but it, it was still <laughs> impossible to get data. And stuff yeah. Like that. Mm -hmm. But they, it's a great company and they, they are really, 
yeah, in the midst of learning uh, in themselves how to do this. Yeah. This is more common. Yeah. Yeah. Many are in the beginning. Yeah. We are behind. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. More questions? So should we hand over to Marvin? She will wrap up everything with uh, AI Sweden, what is who is AI? helping those kind of companies. That's true. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I know. So we shall have a I said we could do them I got the honor to uh, wrap up it all and present AI Innovation of Sweden that is a national, a neutral and uh, a non-profit organization with the vision of uh, making Sweden is a leading nation in the holistic application of AI solution in industry and society. And as we normally are uh, internationally, uh, to be continued to be recognized as innovative and in both an ethical and security perspective. I will do this very quickly because I got two minutes and I can talk about this all day. <laughs> so this is my challenge today. Uh, AI Innovation of Sweden actually started as an uh, initiative from the government and channeled through Vinova. Uh, and is one of the AI specific initiatives from Vinova, where uh, both national and regionally, we should build up data and infrastructure, an AI community. 
And this uh, should be done through nodes all around Sweden, through the uh, already existing innovation system uh, and science park and incubation centers. Uh, and the mission is to be to build up an ecosystem and to be an engine in the AI uh, community to make sure that we are creating the activities and tools that is needed to solve the problems for strengthen and uh, accelerating AI uh, and applied AI, because we have a lot of great knowledge within AI. We have a lot of great experts. We are very in the front of the digitalization, but we need to get move quicker when it comes to applied AI. So this was the, the, the mission in uh, one and a half year ago, uh, the, the, the center opened up in Gothenburg and uh, it created a natural center, a regional center. And then during the year we have opened up in Stockholm, we have opened up in Luleå, we have opened up here in the south where me, uh, Malin Larsson, I didn't present myself in the beginning, is the node manager. And then we have Erik Wilson here, who's the project manager. And we together are establishing the, the south node. Uh, and then we also have Örebro and the east in Linköping. What we are building is uh, together we are building an ecosystem, uh, a national, regional and natural ecosystem within the AI. Where, we, where it is important for us to have uh, actors and uh, cooperation partners in all different sectors to be able to build horizontal resources, to learn from each other. Because when it can, comes to AI, as you know, it's very much about how to uh, cross-fertilize the AI. That's when you really get the innovation. You can't only work in your sector. You also need to work across in different sectors because the models can be applied in different, different areas as well. Together with all our, this ecosystem, uh, what are we doing then? The mission is to really accelerate the use in private and the public sector. We are working triple helix. We are working with universities. We are working with the private, the public sector. Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And that is really to strengthen the Swedish industry and competitiveness in the Swedish welfare. And together with the partners, we are building a smorgasbord board with different activities and tools. So we are not doing things by ourselves, we are doing it together with the partners. During the year, we have uh, identified what kind of problems do we have in Sweden. We have heard some of them today, GDPR edge computing, how do we take it further? What is stopping us from running, running faster there? So strategic projects, uh, we will look into, for example, uh, privacy preserving AI together with uh, the, the partners in our ecosystem. Uh, we will drive federated learning. Eric will be the project manager, and this is a national project that we will drive from here, where we will want to involve, to really make sure that we are pushing the front to make to be able for all the businesses and all the sectors to do more business to create a safer environment etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, together as well with uh, all the actors we are creating data factories it is an infrastructure both with technical solutions uh, you talked about uh, your computer before we have a dgx1 it's a little bit more powerful. Here with this, we're also offering the technical, uh, the uh, legal infrastructure and how to work with the data to build a natural platform where all actors can work in there with computational power to test out things, to build this arena for exploring. They can work alone, they can work together with people and with other partners. Uh, as we can hear here today as well, we are building educational program for organizations that are in different levels. Uh, and we're doing it together with the partners as well. So for example, uh, SKR, uh, Sveriges Kommun och Regioner, 
uh, here we put them together with the consulting firm where they are now launching um, together with us launching a, a, a educational program within AI for leaders change aging program we gather a lot of data scientists from different kind of companies and started to discuss how can you be a change agent and what we found out from many different companies is that they feel pretty alone because just as you said here uh they get in there and they said yeah uh, we don't really know what to do so you start working and some have really supportive manager and some have don't so here also so that's a few example so uh to really work to gather the data working together with the data labs around in sweden uh, to uh, connect people, to match make people. There is a lot of uh, similar projects and initiatives ongoing. We are the glue in between to make sure that they are getting together instead of working towards each other or working parallel and waste resources, work together. So these uh, kind of uh, things we are doing uh, together as well and starting to build the international co collaboration as well and, and the network to build the real ecosystem and the network to make sure that we, we can learn from each other, we can use strength from each other uh, from different ends and from different perspectives uh, of AI. Uh, I think that was pretty much it. And I think I maybe talked a little bit more than two minutes, but uh, that was a very short recap within uh, what AI Innovation of Sweden is. And if you want to know more, you know, just contact me or Eric or put questions here. Any questions? Or crystal clear? <laughs> Where are you uh, physically located? Here? Right now we are in Lund, uh, as I mentioned before. We have host units in, uh, in uh, each uh, uh, location. So we are located at Mobile Heights right now, uh, but we also have an office in, in Malmö where we're sitting as well. So, uh, and Helsingborg as well, that's true. So uh, we are everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ja. 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 Never play with me now. See? Ah, all right. So we tar den sista sliden här uh, på Stay in Touch. Var, okay, yeah. it was Swedish. <laughs> it's been an ex exciting yeah, day. Yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of interesting presentations and, and good variation. So it was very interesting and, and uh, an extra thanks to all the presenters. Yeah. Uh, here today. Really interesting. We had everything from sound data, a lot of sound, and we had uh, images. So that's perfect. I mean, uh, maybe next time we're going to do a more financial data, time series data. That, that, that's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, very much uh, interesting. And I also a, a big yeah. thank you to uh, Joachim Jardenberg, yes. who's here, and uh, making sure we are streamed online everywhere. Yeah. So that's. Thank you, everybody, for watching us. I uh, hope you did enjoy and learn a lot. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, Joachim, very thank you. Let's applaud for Joachim for helping us with this. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, if you're curious to know more, uh, barrel.ai is the place to start. And from there, you can find us on Meetup. You get all our events and, and uh, follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you have any suggestions or want to create events uh, or find out more, the Slack channel is open to to ask questions and you can find us on the email as well mm -hmm. so yeah very simple melina at barrel uh, dot ai and you on at barrel dot ai david is also co-organizer so david uh, at uh, barrel at ai yeah you got it um yeah you know that's probably yeah. all that we have today i would say 
Yeah. So once again, thank you very much. Until next time. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>